Hi, welcome everyone. I think uh, so after those thought provoking keynotes, uh, we are now into the panel discussion uh, part of the pro of today's program. Uh, I would like to uh, you know welcome our moderator, Professor Dr. K. V. S. Hari. He is the head of uh, his, he leads the standardization committee uh, at TSDSI. I'm a professor in the department of uh, ECE at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He will be moderating today's uh, panel discussion. So over to Dr. Hari. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Anindya. And uh, let me see if I can. Okay, so quick introduction of the panel. Uh, so uh, we have uh, Ms. Gyanya Priya from Infosys, Professor Mati, whom you just heard from University of Aulu, Finland. Mr. Satish Jamadagni is the Vice Chairman of TSDSI and also uh, with Reliance Geo. Uh, Dr. Tommy Svensson, who is from Chalmers University of Technology in Gothenburg, Sweden. And Dr. Sally Ergut from Turkcell, Istanbul, Turkey. So the plan would be that uh, uh, we would have uh, opening remarks from each member. And then uh, we will go into the discussion segments. Um, so I know that we are running behind time. So I request each uh, panelist to stick to the time. So may I now invite uh, Madam Priya to share her thoughts. Yes, ma'am. Do you need any technical assistance, ma'am? Yeah, I'm just uh, trying to share. Um, I can share if you wish. I have added one more slide. That's the reason I'm just trying. Okay. To All right. Yeah, just let me know uh, if you're able to see my screen. Yes, ma'am, it's not yet seen. I can let you know once I could see that. So you need to open your file and then you can click share screen. Yeah, yeah. It is uh, so that's why if you can uh, confirm if you're able to see my screen. Yes, ma'am, it's loading now. Perfect. It's loaded, ma'am. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good evening. Good morning from wherever you are uh, joining. Uh, so I'll take a few minutes to discuss about uh, the evolution of technologies for networks and services as part of this uh, panel. Uh, so uh, to start with, I would like to uh, uh, look at what are the kind of opportunities we see in this space because uh, opportunities and problems actually drive adoption of certain technologies. Uh, so when we look at uh, 5G and uh, beyond, uh, when we started with 5G, it is primarily like focused on the three broad areas. Uh, what is the broadband and uh, massive IoT and uh, URLLC kind of combinations. That is what we had looked at. And the primary focus is how you can actually uplift uh, the IoT, uh, basically uh, going beyond the connectivity for of uh, uh, humans to uh, things, right? So that has been the focus. And if you see like a variety of use cases are there across the industries, right? And uh, if you look primarily from uh, the priority point of view, uh, in, even in Indian context, uh, so some of the basic uh, hygiene factors that are required is uh, health. And uh, then we are looking at uh, the remote education and how you are bringing in an industrial IoT for a variety of industries that uh, we are into. Right. So those are the primary things that has been looked at even in uh, across the globe. Right. But when we are going beyond the 5G, what happens is it is also looking at uh, connected robotics and autonomous systems. 
or how we are going to bring that wireless brain because it is uh, interactions of multiple uh, things and systems together how uh, multi sensory xr applications are addressed uh, so we talked about uh, in the previous sessions also uh, a variety of xr uh, applications uh, which is driving certain uh, requirements so when we talk about the immersive media with ar vr etc in today's context when we are moving towards uh, 6g where uh, we are expecting um, a microseconds kind of uh, uh, latency etc and also a good uh, 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 bandwidth in that uh, terahertz uh, range um, uh, the other kind of use cases are primarily the holograms where you can actually teleport and then uh, have real conversations right uh, so those are the kind of requirements we see but while doing this uh, uh industry specific views etc there is also a need to focus on security and privacy and it is not just considered it just in one layer but it has to be looked across the layers and in an integrated fashion so this is what we are so seeing from mostly from industries and the kind of expectations that we have uh when we are looking at 5g and beyond and uh, some of the uh, parameters associated with both 5g and uh, 6g are highlighted which other speakers also talked about so i am not going to go deeper so what really it means right so we are not looking at all these uh, industries as individual uh, on on the bottom you see uh, it is it is an ecosystem so when we go 5g or uh, 6g the focus is more on how you are creating that ecosystem of collaboration for innovation so on the telecom side if you look at from the chip to the cloud right so it's it's completely like to be integrated right uh, so that you can bring the best benefits to the end users uh, for example when we talk uh, uh, the other topic that was discussed in today's session was on the edge right uh, so edge is going to pay, play a, a key role it it can be there even in the 4g right and 5g it is getting enhanced further and 6g it becomes much more critical right uh, so edge compute there are variety of options that are there telco specific edge that can exist or uh, how they collaborate with hyperscalers and see coexistence of edge between those two ran there were multiple discussions talked about uh, cloud ran o ran etc right uh, so edge is definitely playing one key role and how you are going to integrate the vertical uh, industries and the uh, uh, services together right uh so so that is uh, the primarily uh, the key uh, just to give few examples right today uh, in the pandemic situation uh, everybody is working remotely right uh, in in the education sector remote sessions are happening right so today uh, the how the telecom services are being taken is it is it is completely handled separately and the vertical industries or the end users are taking the connectivity services separately right but these two are not actually integrated right for example if i am uh, in this panel discussion if my bandwidth goes low right can i automatically through this uh, platform yarmic platform itself can i ask for a higher bandwidth right so is that possible today no right uh, so those are the kind of collaborations i am discussing about uh, how uh, the telco and the vertical industries can work together uh, so that the platforms itself are uh, self enabled to address the kind of requirements which the end users really look at whether it is a consumer or it is an enterprise uh, customer right uh, so those are some of the driving points i just wanted to highlight right and uh, when we go beyond this uh, 5g uh, right the, there are uh, varied enabling technologies right which, which are primarily focused as the research areas uh, getting into the 6g uh, space right it it starts from your uh, uh, terahertz band communications right network automation there are variety of uh, open source forums also that exist how you can look at the network automation how you can focus more on the virtualization etc so that is all happening today but going forward what are the other things that needs to be looked at how we can do um, uh, not just only the mobile communication part with 5g 6g etc how it can connect with the other terrestrial uh, communications or uh, satellite communications so those kind of interworking of uh, uh, technologies also becomes very uh, critical but i would like to just focus on one of the topic uh, which is very important because in 6g we are talking about not just only connected things but going beyond connected things to connected intelligence 
and that is where like okay uh, ai becomes very much important and it plays a key role in uh, 6g and beyond so some of the research work that has happened across the globe right i try to put the summary of those uh, so ai looks at robotics nlp machine learning computer vision and many many others right uh, so from a cognitive radio perspective like how ai optimized spectrum usage can be leveraged for optimal performance similarly when you take the physical and the mac layer the channel estimation prediction and uh, many other uh, uh, possibilities are there uh, when we look at uh, uh, ai in the actual wireless routing uh, right uh, energy efficient kind of solutions right uh, those kind of scenarios becomes very key and another point to discuss here is like uh, can uh, the ai is not just looked at as a centralized solution because you need definitely a huge computing power etc and when we look at uh, 5g 6g combinations right it is going to be huge data sets that that's going to be available uh, so having a central kind of solution and uh, taking the results to the edge is not going to help so it has to be a distributed ai edge specific ai and also distributed ai where we are looking at from core to the end devices uh, where uh, there is a focus correct and in the uh, devices also what we need to look at is how we can handle with the low uh, footprint kind of scenario right uh, so uh, those are other uh, areas that is being looked at and the rest of the topics is mostly associated with the uh, orchestration management and how you can look at automations etc uh so some of the uh, uh, techniques that are being looked at are like supervised learning reinforcement learning and uh, uh, unsupervised learning and some of the specific examples are also highlighted right supervised learning and uh, um, uh, reinforcement learning all refers to like okay you are doing a modeling and the labels are already available but in case of unsupervised learning those labels are not there and this is primarily needed in the context of optimizing the end user quality of experience or network security because you won't know what kind of applications you are going to uh, that is going to hit the network and what kind of devices are going to uh, get connected to the network right so it becomes much more uh, uh, specific right we have to look at unsupervised learning uh, uh, solutions uh, to optimize uh, end user uh, experience and of course the network automation is also another key area uh because uh, it is, we are looking at self driving uh, networks and uh, uh, today if you see uh, for vehicular communications uh, these kind of technologies are used right how how we can uh, have autonomous uh, driving or uh, the kind of examples that was discussed was uh, the platooning kind of stories right uh, so there are many such uh, scenarios possible and uh, ai is playing a key role and uh, uh, but primarily uh, for adoption of any technology whether it is a 5g or 6g uh, primary focus is uh, how you are going to what is actually driving uh, so the vertical industries the kind of uh, end user scenarios that needs to be prioritized so i would like to pass here and uh, hand it over back to professor hari uh, after sharing my initial views on this thank you thank you very much madam uh, thank you uh, may i now invite uh, satish uh, jamudagni uh, from reliance geo uh, to share uh, his perspective about how things will happen in the next decade decade uh, decade is quite a bit of time <laughs> so decade is a long time i mean um, if you look at uh, the way things have been going on uh, for 5g especially very recently um one of the trends that we are seeing is that standardization is getting regional like it or not but uh, <laughs> it's it's trying to get there um so you recently uh, a couple of days back there was an announcement um, called as the next g alliance it was predominantly north american uh is north american it is totally focused on uh, the north american operators and the uh, odm so that is one of the trends that we are seeing this is not a very technical forecast but uh, um i i believe that 
if you do see this trend uh, going forward you will see that um, you may have standalone uh, specifications coming up and you will need to have uh, a huge amount of interoperability efforts put in by other organizations or whatever organizations to primarily harmonize across these multiple islands of uh, um, standards which will evolve. This is one of the observations. Uh, coming to technology itself as such, for example, 5G, if you look at 5G uh, and compare it with 4G, for example, uh, can, one can very easily see that uh, there are questions on spectral efficiencies of 5G because LTE is primarily OFTM based and you also have 5G, which is OFTM based. So there's always the comparison of how much of spectral efficiency is 5G really giving you. And uh, these are some of the key questions that uh, operators tend to ask. You now, for example, if you look at, um, look at the fact that uh, 5G will, of course, have a larger bandwidth, and that's precisely where your gains are coming from. But if you do an Apple to Apple comparison, there are always questions um, that, that uh, does come up. As to what 5G really brings onto the table, there are other issues. Now, if you, there is another thing that you have to notice about 5G. The 5G formal specification uh, submission to IMT 2020 has still, still refers to narrowband IoT as the MMTC um, specification. 5G was supposed to come out with, uh, with a formal <laughs> MMTC specification. Uh, but that did not happen for whatever reason and one had to fall back on Narban IoT specification which is primarily uh, has been evolving through the LTE uh, releases. So that is one thing that one has to observe. So obviously uh, these are all gaps. Once you find these gaps in 5G, those are the ones which you will immediately want to plug as part of 5G++ or beyond 5G or, or 6G whatever one might call it. So this is what we will see. Then uh, comes the question of uh, adoption of, uh, you know, some of these technologies like, so for example, V2X, uh, drones, and all these other kind of technologies. Uh, yes, there is a strong uh, incentive to uh, connect uh, and control all of these. But much of this will be driven by as much by local regulations as well. And uh, that is also something that has to be noted uh, that each of these technologies will evolve uh, as per the local regulations. And for example, uh, the, uh, the aviation directorate in India is trying to come out with specific rules and regulations for, um, you know, for drones. Uh, th that will influence the way in which uh, this geography will, will span out drones. So, uh, you know, if somebody says that I have harmonized uh, services layer which uh, for drones, uh, it's, it's always suspect as to how it will span out in different geographies. So I believe that in the next uh, decade, uh, there, is a there will be a lot of emphasis on open systems and along with open systems, the definition of open systems may vary from, from geography to geography. There's a certain amount of uh, um, uh, individual open system definitions that might emerge. And some of these so-called open systems, uh, you know, there always tends to be a local consortium uh, to, to drive certain things much faster. And the fact that you have uh, companies, internet companies coming into the fray, like for example, the Googles and the Apples, they're not used to global uh, standardization ever. They, they have always driven their own standards and uh, it's brute force method where they say, I go to the market, if it wins, it wins, it doesn't win, it doesn't win. It's a brute force, uh, force way of taking specification to the market. And if it becomes successful then it becomes a de facto standard there's no such thing as a ratified standard but it's a de facto standard now they are becoming increasingly involved in the the cloudification of uh, uh cloudification of of say for example 5g specification or in the open standard so one will also see that there will be pushes and pulls from this industry as well strong push and pulls from this industry there's another key thing that I want to bring on to the table. Security also will, will be governed more from geographies 
uh, and national interest and uh, i i see i foresee that um, in the next decade uh, the so called um, the the politics of 5g carried forward <laughs> will will play out so obviously security will um, Uh, will be driven by national concerns so there will be islands of security protocols which will come up with, with, uh, i'm not for it or against it but yeah i mean this is something that i'm seeing happening how will all of this play out will be interesting and that is what will drive standardization in the next decade so uh, you have uh, uh oran which came up uh, outside of cgpp and you have uh, oran uh, policy alliance which was driven by the us government and you know these kind of trends will play out in the next decade uh because we'll see rest of technologies i think other speakers will talk but i just wanted to bring this perspective on the table because these will be the important uh, factors which will drive uh, or force uh, drive force specification in the next decade thank you Thank you, Satish. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, may I now invite uh, Dr. Sali Ergut uh, from Turkcell, Istanbul, Turkey, to share uh, his opening remarks. Uh, sir, sorry, sir, we are not able to hear you. You are muted. I no, he is on unmute, but. Uh, Yes, sir. We can now. hear you. Okay, and you can see my screen as well. I hope. Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, hello, all. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of this panel discussion. Uh, I'd like to give a brief overview of uh, Turkcell, uh, the the mobile operator in Turkey. We are actually a converged uh, communication network provider. Uh, like. Uh, I'm sorry. I think he has a uh, internet connection issue. Sali sir, I think you are lost. Uh, can you please speak so that we can check your connection? All right. Uh, his connection is lost. So I'll hand over the session to the chairperson to decide whether you like to invite the next person or you want to wait. Uh. Let us give him about ten seconds. Let yes. us see if he comes back. Uh, yeah. All right. In the meantime, attendees, if you like to put your questions, you can put it in the Q and A box. Uh, that is exclusively for the questions. At the end of the session, now uh, if you have time, definitely the chairperson will be reading the questions. Also, you can keep sharing your feedback, your happiness. You can show your love in the form of the chat box. How much you you are enjoying the session, and how much you are enjoying the speech from the speakers, the panelists. So you can make use of the yes, of course. Uh, I forgot to say about the emote icons, which you people have already been uh, using it. We could uh, see a lot of emote icons coming over there, which shows your happiness and your satisfaction. Also, you can leave it as a text message as well in the chat box. So, okay. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, maybe we can move to the next uh, speaker. So, may I invite uh, Dr. Tommy Swenson to share uh, his opening remarks? Okay, thank you for uh, inviting me. Do you see my screen? Yes, sir. We can see the screen, sir. Okay, so uh, I would like to do a few uh, remarks uh, in this opening about uh, opportunities and technical challenges for 16 millimeter wave and terahertz. So uh, just a quick uh, uh, comment on uh, the group at Chalmers. We've been very active in European research all since 3G times and over the, over 4G and 5G. And uh, some potential upcoming uh, new uh, projects also in 6G that we have been involved in. Um, so, and this is a quick overview of the kind of research I've been doing in my team. Cooperative communications, alternative wireless networks, cellular tweaks, Internet of Things, satellite return links, and efficient networks and fire mac network slicing enablers as i call them so just a quick uh, overview to get to know me so um uh, and beyond <clears throat> i think a new era has begun in 4g times we went for an internet that really to be a mobile internet 
in 5G, we enrich the mobile internet uh, and we uh, open up for more massive internet of things. Um, and also robust low latency towards internet of skills. Um, this is uh, still work to be done, I would say. Um, it might spill over to 6G as well, as Matti also commented on today. But what about 6G? I think 6G will be quite much about uh, AI. Um, both in the sense of um, <clears throat> uh, that the mobile networks should uh, support AI algorithms uh, and also that the mobile networks themselves will be designed based on uh, machine learning and AI and, and the online operation uh, will also have aspects of uh, uh, ML and AI. But if you go back to the applications, um, when, we, when we have a, a discussed set of, uh, internet of skilled uh, persons, if they can devote some of their time to train AI agents, we can we can we win two things. We can duplicate, and that uh, means that we get the access to more more of these uh, skills, and we can also put them far out in the network, in mobile edge computing clouds, enable uh, con uh, more democratic access to these skills too. It's not only in the in the various uh, center of the around the, the human skilled person. So I think that uh, this can be a driver for 6G. Convergence of computing, communications, storage, and arti artificial intelligence towards massive and distributed, that is local internet of skills. Uh, to do this, we need uh, research for holistic research and based on holistic performance metrics. End-to-end -end latency, end-to-end -end security, total efficiency, sustainability, and so on. So we, we have taken part in, in uh, the, the nice uh, flagship uh, set up by uh, Matti and the team at Olo. Uh, so uh, one was a broadband connectivity 60 white paper. We also did an extension article there. It's available in archive. And another one on location and sensing, which I think is, uh, will be important part of 6G. So there we also have white paper and, and uh, archive uh, version of, uh, of an IT I2 access paper. <clears throat> so I will spend a, a minute on technical enablers. Um, definitely the frequency range. Uh, we will uh, try to see what we can do with up a millimeter way, with sub terahertz and towards pure terahertz and also visible light. And do that in harmony and combination in a clever way. Um, we, we have worked on, on convergence of access back called frontal, uh, and that I think is enabled even further to enable network slicing or the way out in FIMAC. We need to, when we get up, up in frequency, we need to go to massive arrays to, to compensate for the lower antenna aperture. And here we have paper on, on uh, optimal care frequency for different massive, massive MIMO links. Uh, we cannot dig fiber to everything, so we need to, to embrace the opportunity for our access, wireless access uh, combined with uh, wireless backhauling in an integrated way, maybe augmented with optical frequencies. We, when we have very narrow beams at high frequency, we need to guide the communication of these beams. Um, to, to, uh, and then we win many things. We, we mean, uh, mean we win reliability, we win uh, uh, lower RF exposure in sensitive areas, and and uh, and um, higher data rates. Uh, we also need to, uh, when we densify a lot, we also really need to put this use in the center. We did that partly in coordinated multipoint times and the dynamic clustering approaches, but when we do even further dense, we need to think uh, in uh, other ways. So distribute large MIMO schemes towards cell-free approaches. And that have been highlighted here on a vertical knee, uh, in, uh, in uh, rural coverage, particular, uh, I think, 6G. We talked about in early 5G2, but in 6G, we really need to embrace the vertical domain. Uh, uh, and they're also coming up, the drones are getting more important than other airborne, airborne uh, hubs uh, solutions and uh, uh, satellites. And as we worked on Nationals over 10 years on mobile base stations, that I think also would have a good role in many areas. And by doing this, we need to think about integrated mobility. It's not a, a higher layer protocol. This is an integrated way. We need to think about spider handovers, multi-connectivity in a very smooth, uh, liquid way. So with this overview uh, in a short time, I also want to highlight that on terahertz level, 
uh, there are so many more opportunities um, for sensing in different ways. Uh, so the, the industry can be very broader. Uh, and we had a big initiative two years ago in Europe. I was uh, in the kernel of setting up a Terra's flagship. We didn't go all the way through. Batteries were more important in Europe back then. But so many opportunities here, and you can see the commitment of 176 organizations in Europe. So with that, I want to finish, finalize my pitch. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tommy. Um, have we got uh, Dr. Saleh back? Uh, not yet, sir. Not yet. OK. So what we'll do is uh, we will start uh, the next round of uh, the next part. Uh, Anindya, how much time do we have? We are already close to uh, 9 PM local time. So nevertheless, we'll just have some discussion. Uh, so we have uh, an interesting overview of uh, technologies, applications, and also the perspective from uh, a, uh, an operator. Uh, so I would like to ask if the 6G is uh, very dependent on the availability of spectrum, if we have to realize the next generation. So is spectrum going to be a key stumbling block or is there any other way of uh, using uh, ideas like cognitive radio uh, or in the available spectrum and come up with something interesting? So I will pose this uh, question to uh, Dr. Mati. Thank you, Harry. Uh, when we talk about the next commercial versions of 5G and potential 6G frequency bands, we are talking about millimeter waves and above. So there's plenty of spectrum available. There's no doubt of that. The question is, uh, what are the uh, under study group 13? What uh, are the technical solutions and uh, and uh, what what is the, for example, link range versus capacity? Then the question about things like cognitive radio and dynamic spectrum usage. Definitely, those are worth investigating at existing and lower frequency bands. What would those bring to us? But uh, it could be that world is not yet ready for those, and we need more time to mature implementation of through cognitive radio still and uh, which is somehow related also to this uh, ORAN type of thinking that uh, with simple changes in in software you would be able to configure your radio equipment for this and that but as we see already today with 4G and and now with 5G that how complicated um, base station equipment is today Passive MIMO technologies, for example, or multi, the MIMO, MIMO technologies in general, how sophisticated those are, how much dedicated hardware, software components they require. I'm personally a little bit skeptical about this software uh, uh, reconfiguration with current implementation technologies. So something major should happen to make cognitive radio type of thinking possible. OK, thank you. Uh, on the same topic, I would like to know how an operator would really uh, react to either availability or non-availability of spectrum. So may I invite Satish uh, to uh, give a perspective of the ground reality of spectrum availability and the policies, of what would enable uh, the 6G? So sorry to interrupt. In the meantime, Dr. Salia uh, has also joined. I just want to keep you informed. Thank you. Satish. Okay. Um, so, so for an operator, um, typically it's always good to have two radio technologies live. I mean, nothing beyond that. If we have 5G and 6G, then that is it. The assumption is that the 4G spectrum would all be uh, recovered by that time. Or if you have 4G and 5G, then obviously it's not always good to have uh, 3G and 2G networks also because that, that's a burden on the overall economics and uh, you understand how it works. So in that sense, when we are talking about 6G, uh, the assumption is that uh, there would be only 5G and 6G in place. 
and uh, the the entire spectrum the lower band spectrum would be made available um, for 6g at that time so spectrum as much as it is an issue i think there are ways of solving uh, the same as well so it's, it's not so much of a concern that we have to go into terahertz and stuff like that I and mean, it's going to be a bit tricky though i mean of course i mean it's a challenging technology to work on as an engineer but uh, it's going to be tricky to realize systems because even in millimeter wave we are facing a lot of problems and we know what the challenges are um so so that's one of the key points to observe and there's a willingness even from governments to uh, relinquish uh, these uh, bands in the lower uh, band spectrum uh, for uh, 5g and 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 the whole covid situation has been really helpful i mean the government is now treating this as a national asset rather than you know just another business vertical that really helps so so spectrum will uh, is not so much of a concern it can be sorted out uh so may i pose uh, may i request uh, dr sali uh, are you there oh he has lost the connection again yes i'm sorry again i think uh, okay. we are having internet okay so uh i think uh, what uh, the next question i would like to pose is uh, since uh, mm, we are looking at something beyond 5g Uh, are there some new technology solutions which the research community has to develop in order to address those application driven requirements or specifications which uh, the current uh, generation of uh, tools in either signal processing or rf or microwaves that we really need to build uh, to realize prototypes and try that so may i pose this question to dr tommy So you mean from the hardware perspective? Because the 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 big challenge there, whoever they go up on high frequency, is the massiveness. Um, so uh, at um, uh, every every time we are reducing the the or the wavelength with a factor of ten, we need a uh, hundred times more uh, antennas to feel the same effective aperture. So, so the the integration there and, and be able to produce this um, and find the uh, find the technologies for doing that. That is a big challenge on the hardware perspective. So here, I think it's very important to do this jointly with signal processing and and uh, hardware to find what problem should be solved at what end. For example, in machine MIMO, we know that some of the impairments are averaging away. some or not mm -hmm. okay thank you uh, i think we have dr sali a good back so uh, may i request him to uh, share his thoughts uh, if you are able to uh, share your screen and welcome back uh sorry for that uh, i realized that i got disconnected so i am not exactly sure when i lost you uh but uh, maybe i can just like briefly discuss again so i will uh, may i i will ask basically uh, like for and sir i am sorry yeah. to interrupt dr sali in case you have a bad internet connection probably can turn off your video that's a suggestion from my side so that at least the audio quality is better or maybe once your internet okay. is good probably okay. you can turn on your video again all right so, so you, you, yeah dr sali you may address uh, one issue oh he's lost the connection okay are you back yes, yes i am i'm back. back so i i turned off okay. my video so that it's better audio you may comment on uh, is spectrum an issue for the next generation or you have new technology solutions which you think should be deployed for the next generation applications and um, as for spectrum so we are actually uh, i mean we, we start with 5g with uh, sub 6 uh, i'm started using sub 6 uh, frequencies 6 gigahertz frequencies 
Uh, and we see that like the uh, millimeter wave is uh, not very quick to, to be deployed. And then there are uh, the coverage issues with, with as you go higher frequencies, then there are some coverage issues that you need to address. And for operators, it's very costly to, to make that investment. So now we are seeing trends within operators to share the infrastructure, uh, to share the investment, uh, and have businesses on top of that. Uh, so like the new frequencies, especially when we are going higher the uh, band, I mean, uh, frequency spectrum, uh, we, need, we will see some uh, different business models for operators so that they, they become uh, feasible. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to now move to one uh, pressing question which everybody is asking is about the open RAM or open initiatives like we have open air interface, we have open RAM and uh, I would like to request uh, Madam Ganapriya to sort of share her views on uh, about this openness or the philosophy of uh, technologies and other things being open. How would it impact uh, developing the uh, required applications for uh, what we need? Uh, how good, how open should open be? Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Professor. Uh, definitely, like uh, uh, openness is uh, very much required because uh, we are talking about 5G, it is more of an ecosystem. Uh, Interoperator uh, uh, handshakes and uh, uh, solution development is very critical. Uh, so that is where through organizations uh, like uh, Telemanagement Forum and uh, uh, HC, MEC, uh, specifications, or even if you take uh, um, uh, the MEF kind of standards, right? So everybody is uh, looking at uh, building an open uh, API kind of solutions uh, so that easy integrations are possible. Uh, so uh, that is primarily from the openness perspective, uh, which helps in driving open digital architecture, not just only on the IT layer, but the same actually gets uh, uh, towards the network layer as well. That's the reason more focus has been on how you can do network as a service or connectivity as a service so that it can be easily consumed by the applications and adoption is also like uh, much more easier. Uh, so that is one part of the story. The other part is actually looking at uh, uh, the open forums that are there, right? Uh, for example, open networking, ONF, uh, uh, right? Or uh, if you take, for example, uh, the management uh, kind of solutions, which is coming from ONAP uh, through Linux foundations, or uh, there are multiple, multiple open source uh, communities that are there, which are actually like building those solutions, right? Uh, which actually creates a lot of innovation. Uh, it is open for innovation and uh, once it gets hardened and uh, reaches a certain stage and it is getting adopted, right? The same thing we have seen on the open RAN, right? Uh, we started with the RAN, Cloud RAN, and uh, now more into this open RAN, right? And uh, uh, it is just only one part of the overall uh, radio solution, right? Now it is getting extended for the other areas also, right? Uh, so once the innovation is get stabilized, then it can easily get into the mainstream, uh, which will also help uh, the traditional players as well. Uh, so that is what we are seeing in the market. And uh, we are also adopting that way, right? Uh, apart from the traditional players, how you can uh, build more uh, open platform solutions. Thank you, Madam. Uh, the last question on this topic would be, I would like to pose it to Professor Mati. Can the file layer be open? Uh, yes and no. Um, <clears throat> there are certain capabilities that uh, uh, the hardware radio equipment have, and uh, that brings in, in uh, limitations that what we can do with hardware. So even if you would like to wish to, to, to keep it open, there is limit to openness. That's one thing. The other thing is maybe that there's a lot of discussion these days about using machine learning tools to to let it optimize even physical layer for given uh, uh, channel conditions, which is really interesting thought. And uh, we will have to see and do much more research on where we can get with that type of thinking. But there will be always limitation coming from the hardware itself. 
Okay. So maybe Satish, can you quickly react? How would an operator react to things being open? Uh, would the business model change? So today, in fact, uh, if you look at the overall specifications, you do have uh, the file layer split, which is available. Uh, there is also uh, a full file layer split, which is available. And you also have uh, a lower file and upper file split also, which is available uh, in what is now called as the radio unit and the distributed unit, RU and DU. So it is expected the DU. So in some sense, the split is already there today. And now the question is, uh, how, what do you mean by openness? In the sense, uh, for a given technology, this is all that you can do. I mean, you can throw open APIs uh, to the physical layer. Um, and above the physical layer, I mean, you can put in any Mac or whatever. I mean, to that extent, the APIs are available today to, to plug in anybody's Mac. Uh, so um, to that extent, it is open. Uh, what is interesting is that to run Phi, the open hardware is not very much available today. You have very generic models which are available. For example, you always use a, there is a RF component, there is a radio component, there is a FPGA and there's some processing which is needed and that is a general understanding. But, but uh, you know, generic availability of a hardware with enough MIPS and radio interfaces and stuff like that where you can run a run a software which say for example i buy from a third party and i just put in a lower file which i buy from a university and put it in or can i plug in algorithms uh, because different 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 universities come up with different algorithms and you always keep questions to be answered uh, i'm seeing lost connection I'm sorry, Mr. Sadish, you lost connection and you joined back. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. So, am I audible now? Yes. So, yes. so, that is something that has to be addressed. So, today, if you look at the ORAN specification, there is something called as a radio interface, uh, a radio intelligent controller, RIC, and that sits above the E node B, and it's still not deep within the physical layer. So, uh, there is a lot of, a lot of opportunities where we can go deep within the uh, a physical layer and throw open certain APIs where you are early scheduling before the Mac, the Mac scheduling itself can be open where you can plug and play a lot of algorithms uh, on, on the run. That is yet to come. And that's where there is a lot of uh, innovation and uh, scope in that regard. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, we maybe we should. Uh, have in the final closing uh, remarks from each one of you, but I will pose a question here. Uh, we are all belonging to different uh, uh, layers of the ecosystem. We have academicians, we have uh, uh, people from industry, we have operators. So how do you think that uh, uh, we should collaborate so that we can accelerate the development of 6G? Uh, is there any model uh, which you think uh, academia should uh, uh, sort of look at? Uh, should the interaction be more closer to the operator, to the end user, to the industry who build apps? So I would like uh, Professor Marty to start and then Professor Tommy, then uh, Madam Vyanapriya, Satish, and then Sally if he joins us back. So in that order. So Professor Marty, go ahead first. At the moment, I think it's the greatest responsibility and challenge for us academia to come up with uh, completely innovative new ideas. How could we drastically make a big leap from 5G to wherever? And uh, timing wise, this is beautiful time since uh, uh, 60 frequencies are earliest allocated by WRC in 27. So we have plenty of time to do good quality research and challenge industrial operators with crazy new ideas. But when we discuss, for example, our Nokia colleagues, they are asking all the time, where are your radically new ideas? So they are really looking for these radical ideas and we have to go for that now. We have still time, several years. Okay, Dr. Tommy. Uh, yes, uh, I definitely believe in this uh, collaboration uh, between academia and industry, uh, both vendors and uh, operators and, uh, and understanding end users. Um, 
I think uh, in Sweden and Scandinavia, I think we have a quite healthy ecosystem there with industry and academia. And then on top, uh, we have these uh, European research programs uh, with uh, they're quite big 2030 partners with uh, we do uh, system concepts. Um, so that's the ecosystem. But then I think towards uh, 6G, it might be uh, we need a new component if we believe in that. Um, um, okay, uh, I, the system gets more and more complicated, M meaning that if we divide and conquer too much with uh, with uh, simple analytical problem formulations, we might lose too much in the end because there are too many components. So I sincerely believe in, in machine learning as a way to probe getting ideas for new solutions. And then we can go back to theory and try to understand them and analyze better and get better analytical models and, and confirm the ideas. So this interaction, and when we do that, data is king. And there, I think there's a new way of uh, working even more intensively. And to be honest, uh, industry should be more active, not passive. Telling academia can with ideas. Sure, but tell, give us the problem, give us the data. So here I see a disruption possibilities in the in the next decade. Thank you, Madam Ganapriya. Please share your thoughts. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so as other uh, panelists mentioned, uh, industry collaboration is definitely needed because that is what is going to drive uh, 5G and uh, beyond, right? Uh, because uh, till 4G, like more of uh, consumer specific applications and other things were there. Uh, but uh, 5G and beyond is going to bring all the vertical industries together. Hence, collaboration is needed. I would like to look at this in two different uh, dimensions. One is uh, for the 6G specifics, what are the uh, possible uh, industry variants or solutions that can be brought up? And uh, we can have like a community to work on that, right? So you're starting from the business requirements and down to like, okay, how it is addressed with the new technologies, et cetera. So this is for the future proofing kind of solution. The other dimension I would like to look at is uh, uh, 5G is uh, kickstarting in many places and already in uh, US, uh, uh, Korea, uh, multiple countries trials and actual commercial stuff also has started. Uh, many of the learnings from 5G needs to actually get into 6G, right? Uh, because uh, we are saying 6G uh, AI is going to play a key role over there, right? Uh, but today, uh, do we have enough data uh, which is analyzed from the 5G, right? Because it is just started. So we may need to do more and more of those kind of data uh, uh, collection, analysis, etc., so that we can build a good model uh, which can actually help the uh, 6G as well, right? Uh, so considering these scenarios, like if we can collaborate and uh, do what happens as uh, hackathons or uh, uh, point of um, uh, views and uh, a proof of concepts, right? I think that will help uh, driving the specifications as well, uh, because once it is proved, like it, it actually gets into the standards, right? Uh, so these are some of the possible ways I see uh, how we can uh, collaborate and take things forward. Thank you. Uh, so I think we have Dr. Sali back. So maybe I'll give him uh, the next uh, chance to, and then I will leave the last word to our vice chair Satish later. So Dr. Sali, can you please share uh, how you think uh, all the different stakeholders can work together so that we can uh, provide a better user experience uh, to uh, the customers of operators? Yes. Uh I mean, from starting 5G, uh, we are actually designing the overall system, taking into account of all verticals. So this was not the case before. So, and this will be continuing for 6G. And uh, as the networks become more complicated, uh, as uh, many panelists indicated, AI will become very key in managing these networks. In terms of academy and industry collaboration, uh, I see like two uh, different types of collaboration. One of them is actually having the expertise like from the academy and uh, the industry defines the problems. Maybe we can uh, consider AI being in this domain. Uh, like the, there are many uh, research areas worked in AI and uh, the telecommunication industry is now having new problems so they can collaborate. But then there are some issues such as like explainability of 
of your algorithms. So uh, it's very important for mission critical services, like the distributed or federated learning, like the transfer learning for operators. So these are like very new areas that operators do not have any expertise. Uh, but have a lot of information on, on, on use cases. And then the second area is where the uh, academy uh, actually leads the industry. Uh, as, as for 6G, I think one of the paradigm changes is the non-terrestrial networks. Basically, we are seeing a big change here where uh, now we will see drones like high altitude platforms then low orbit satellites. I mean, this is a big change for operators. Uh, maybe you are not gonna, you're gonna get your phone service from Amazon instead of your local telecommunication service provider. Uh, so here now operators need to get ahead and see how they can actually influence these technologies, maybe be part of it. I mean, you cannot prevent uh, from something happening. and like new designs or architectural changes are actually taking long time for operators. I think in this area, uh, the academy can lead. Uh, they can actually think more freely. Uh, and so this, I mean, I see this type of actually collaborations would benefit both of them. Right. Thank I mean, you. as for non terrestrial networks, we are already seeing like standards forming up in 3DPP. Okay, so Satish, uh, I will uh, ask you to give us the final word and also address how the standards would evolve in the next uh, for the next uh, 6G since you are also heading the vice chair, vice chair of the standards body. So maybe you may want to close uh, using that uh, perspective also. Yes, um, when the uh, when the early 5G specification was being discussed on 3GPP, there were amazing uh, air interface technologies which were on the table. Uh, much of those new air interface technologies were all coming from universities or startups which just came out of universities. So they were amazing technologies, but they were all killed. You know, finally the industry lobbies prevailed <laughs> and the industry typically has a tendency to uh, look at incremental changes because, you know, it's easy to handle backward compatibility and all those issues are there. So that's how it happened. But there were amazing technologies which were on the table. And frankly, it is a loss for us. And we did discuss about the spectral efficiency between 4G and 5G, which is highly questionable. In that sense, having good technologies uh, coming from startups, which are, of course, uh, well researched in the universities is very important for the industry. For that to happen, the best model of collaboration is they come on board very early on. It's not like they independently develop a technology and bring it onto the table on a final day in a 3GPP specification and say, this is my technology, now take it in. No, it doesn't work that way. So you have to come in early. So it is very important for the industry as well, because we are also looking for good technology and good spectral efficiencies, because that brings the cost down. You can give better services. For us to engage with universities so that when they have good technologies and they have startups which are actually trying to productize such good technology, they are plugged in with the rest of the industry reality as well. So that is very key. Uh, that is very important. And uh, it's important because a lot of these companies, if they don't get a win in the 3GPP space, they all die because funds suddenly disappear. So good technology is actually getting killed that way which is bad for the industry. So it's very important the industry engages the uh, universities very early on and they both go hand in hand so that I mean, they understand the technology. And you don't necessarily are pitted against each other. That's very important um, for 6G to, 6G to succeed. And we all understand that the quality of research in universities is way better than any of the industries. So obviously I mean, that is to be respected and uh, taking cognizance of even in the industries. So this has to be facilitated. And the onus is both on the university and on the industry, both. I mean, both will have to talk to each other. And it has to be early on. The day I decide, uh, you know, 6G use case, uh, 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 6G uh, requirements are coming in. That day I'm plugged into all set of universities and I'm probing and I'm trying to pull out technology. That is the way it has to be. 
and uh, as far as standards for the next decade uh, as i told you this is a new phenomenon which is uh, the post covid or just before covid phenomenon that you are seeing a lot of regionalism which is coming out into standards and it is going to play out in a big way and uh, that is what is going to um, also bring in a lot of challenges in terms of say for example uh if you remember before 4g there used to be a lot of technologies japan had its own technology china was trying to come out with its own technology we see another tendency going in that direction again for whatever reason if that does happen then you need a uh, independent bodies which will try to harmonize all of them or at least you know come up with some kind of interoperability specifications across all of them so this is not just not just the, from a specification point of view this is also driven by the nature of the technology itself is such that a lot of regulatory aspects will come into picture once regulatory aspects come into picture you will always i give the example of drones for example the drone service apis and the security protocols which run drones in europe will never be the same as what it will be in india because these are dictated by the governments and the regulatory authorities and for security reasons they you know tend to be unique they they push it in the direction these are tendencies we will have to look out for and and deal with uh, that is one of that's going to be one of the key challenges uh, in the next decade as far as standardization is concerned thank you thank you uh, i think we have run over time uh, but it was a very interesting uh, discussion and a good collection of thoughts uh, i'd like to thank all the uh, speakers of the panel Uh, for a wonderful interesting and invigorating uh, uh, sharing of uh, perspectives and i hope that this will launch us into the next generation uh, uh, technology landscape which we have to shape uh, because it's still open and we need to shape that so thank you very much for uh, being part of it and i'll hand it over to anindya for his uh, closing remarks and uh, we are almost uh, we have shot <laughs> you've gone over time sorry anindya but uh... yes sir i think it was a very engrossing uh, presentation and you know interesting perspectives on beyond 5g uh, 6g and uh, i i would like to thank again all the panelists and you sir uh, for holding uh, this uh, interesting very interesting and very engrossing panel discussion i still see saw that about 80 members were there so at least i thought that <laughs> let me let me continue and uh, because we still want uh, you know a lot of interest in this topic uh, at least uh, made me think that yes we should continue and uh, till the full course so thank you all i think uh, it was a, it was a good uh, panel discussion and uh, i think uh, i believe that attendees would have benefited from it uh, i am just looking at the question i don't see any questions here uh, probably it is a bit late uh, so let's thank the speakers sir. yeah so thank you all i think uh, and i will give it to the host uh, to conclude uh, and we can we can i think we can conclude the session thank you dr marty thank you dr tommy thank you dr sali thank you nana priya and thank you satish thank you professor hari thank you thank you bye thank, thank you. you thank you very much anindya and uh, uh, satish for uh, uh, setting the context of the conference with this session uh, lots of topics that have been uh, touched upon are likely to be detailed upon in the uh, following sessions tomorrow we uh, so for uh, let's meet tomorrow again at uh, uh, 4:50 pm uh, which is the first session for the day uh, which is on spectrum and that will be followed by the session on emerging open standards for 5g and beyond at uh, 705 pm tomorrow see you tomorrow thank you very much bye 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 thank you bye everyone